Thanks, Sam. It's great to be here in whatever sense in which I'm here. Uh, thanks for coming along. Let me know either by sort of waving or by sticking in the chat if you can't hear me too well. Uh, and we'll be getting going. Oh, I put a link in the chat, which is if you either want a copy of the slides or there's actually a handout. Actually, if you have a device, you could scan this thing and get to the web page uh, or go to that URL, uh, which has uh, a handout for the talk. And the handout has got um, more references and a bunch of other things, uh, which I won't have time to go into. It's sort of a, a compressed version of a paper. Uh, and so if you want to explore some of these things more, you could do that. If this was a sort of face-to-face, -face, all in the same place talk, I would have chopped down some trees and got the handout to you. But you can download it if you like. So in this talk, I'm aiming to better understand the speech acts of assertion and denial, uh, their relationships to other speech acts, in particular uh, speech acts of uh, polar questions and justification requests, and connections between speech acts on the one hand and logical notions on the other. Uh, in particular, my focus is going to be on Genson's sequent calculus. So that's the sort of overall sort of picture. I want to explore those things. My prompt for particularly what I'm going to be doing in this paper is uh, revisiting and expanding uh, on some of the themes and the claims that I made in a paper of mine from 2005 called Multiple Conclusions, which is a paper that a bunch of people have been sort of responding to and uh, working with uh, a different sort of interpretation of Genson sequent calculus and a kind of justification of or defense of you know, boring old bog standard classical propositional logic in terms of normative pragmatic notions, in terms of norms governing assertion and denial. So what could be seen as a kind of semantically anti-realist because it's not a representation uh, first analysis of uh, our practices of assertion and denial in a way which is meant to sort of justify uh, the classical sequent calculus. So. Uh, I did that in 2005, and I'd like to revisit some of that, partly because uh, I've learned some things since then. So, uh, my focus is going to be the behavior of two different kinds of speech acts. Polar questions, which are just yes-no questions, kinds of questions where you ask, is it the case that B, and somebody might say yes or say no to answer, and justification requests. Neither of these are themselves assertions or denials. They're different kinds of speech acts, which I think understanding the norms governing those speech acts can help us round out our picture about how assertion and denial work. So here's the plan for the talk. It's four sections. I'm going to start by talking about assertion and denial, sequent calculus. We're going to look at polar questions and how addressing them can help us distinguish different senses of denial. Then we're going to look at positions and rules and look at the sense in which uh, we could be giving uh, an account of the meaning of logical concepts or logical connectives in terms of uh, rules that might look familiar to you from the sequent calculus. And then we'll talk about justification requests. And if we've got time, we'll talk about Lewis Carroll and things like this too. So first section, assertion and denial. The line that I ran in multiple conclusions was that if you see a derivation of a sequent in Genson's sequent calculus, which has got a bunch of statements on the left-hand side, a sequence separator, in this case, the sort of y on its side, and a bunch of statements on the right-hand side, a way to understand the, the oomph of a derivation of such a sequent is that it's telling you, don't get yourself in a position when you're asserting everything on the left-hand side and denying everything on the right. So, for example, because I can scribble on this thing. If you, uh, for example, derived a very simple sequent, which says P and Q on the left and the conjunction P and Q on the right, don't accept both P and Q and deny the conjunction. That's inconsistent. But just equally, Genson's sequent calculus is nicely sort of symmetric and dual, self-dual. Uh, there's another derivation which has got, oh, that's wrong. I've got that the wrong way around. 
it should have been a P or Q on the left and a P and a Q on the right. This uh, sequence, sometimes it's said the things on the right hand side are to be understood disjunctively and the things on the left hand side are to be understood conjunctively. Well, one, one reason for that is that we can derive from the premise P or Q, the two distinct conclusions P and Q. Now that doesn't mean you can derive P and you can derive Q, of course not, any more than in the first sequence where you derive P and Q from P and from Q. That doesn't mean you can derive it from P and you can derive it from Q. Now the P and Q you've got to use together to get the conjunction. Similarly, you've got to have these P and Q together as alternates, if you like, if you're going to conclude that from the premise P or Q. And the, the, the analysis that I gave in multiple conclusions was that this is exactly symmetric, both of these cases. Don't assert everything on the left and deny everything on the right. Don't assert a disjunction, P or Q, and deny both disjuncts. That would be inconsistent in just the same way. So uh, that's the, the story that I gave in multiple conclusions. And I then said that you could get a defense of the uh, sp particularly special structural rules in the sequent calculus, like this uh, rule of identity, the reflexivity rule, if you like, which says, you know, don't assert something and deny it at the very same time. That would be inconsistent. There's a clash involved in asserting A and denying A. Whatever the job of denial is, it's to rule out assertion. Whatever the job of assertion is, it's to rule out denial at the very least. So that would be a mistake. So you can see that the rule of identity uh, makes sense. And these extra things on the, the left and on the right, they're just saying, you're not going to get out of this kind of clash by adding more commitments, by asserting other things or denying other things. You're not going to get out of the clash that you've got when you've asserted A and denied A. No, the only way out of this is to withdraw one of those, at least. And then the rule of cut, uh, again, is something which is just a structural feature. It's not looking inside these judgments to any of the particular contents there. I'm not saying, oh, this is a conjunction or this is a negation or whatever. And there's lots of different ways that you can understand the rule of cut. Let's think of it contrapositively. Uh, if there's no clash involved in asserting the X's and denying the Y's, then for example, if, uh, you know, adding A to the denial side was ruled out, well, then A is undeniable. And after all, you know, asserting something that is undeniable in that it would be inconsistent to deny is just to, you know, make explicit what you were implicitly committed to already, for example. So if this one is not ruled out, that one is. Uh, sorry, if this one is ruled out, that one isn't. So in particular, if asserting A is ruled out and denying A is ruled out, uh, then you're in a problem in the first place. Now, a lot of people, in particular, uh, the folks that are interested in, you know, non-transitive uh, conceptions of logic, uh, the strong and weak assertion sort of people, uh, like Dave Ripley and others, have, you know, argued about this. There's lots of interesting discussions to be had. I'm going to extend these discussions a little bit today, but I'm going to put a pause on that. One of the features of what makes a structural rule a structural rule is the thought is it's governing assertion and denial as such without any focus on the particular content or the particular structure of what's been asserted or what's been denied. It's just part of the, the game of getting into the assertion and denial practice. And then when you look at logical concepts, then you get a nice story which says, for example, one way to understand how conjunction works is that to assert a conjunction has got the same effect on the position that you take as asserting both of the conjuncts. Or to deny a disjunction, same effect as to deny both of the disjuncts. Or to assert a negation, same, same general you know, cash value as denying the thing negated. Or to deny a conditional is to assert the antecedent and deny the consequent. It's got the same force as that and so on. Same for things involving the quantifiers. I'm not going to go into the quantifiers too much today. Uh, now, you can think of these things as definitions uh, of the concepts uh, that they introduce. They're kind of saying, imagine you had a practice where you asserted and denied stuff, uh, 
I could tell you something about the rules governing asserting conjunctions in terms of the rules governing asserting their components. And so I could tell you something about how to get into the practice of conjoining stuff, at least asserting them. There's then a question about what, what about denying them? Because after all, denying a conjunction is something that you might do. And that's where you'd say something about, well, it's going to count as an assertion. It's going to count as a denial. It, it's a content which could be assertable or deniable. And so it will be governed by the other structural rules. But the whole point of introducing something into our practice is it enables us to do something that we couldn't do before. So denying a conjunction is not going to be reducible to asserting or denying the components, uh, but it's going to be constrained in some way. And we'll look more at that, you know, in a bit. Anyway, that was the, the kind of line that I ran. Now, in multiple conclusions, when I was doing this, I was appealing to norms governing assertion and denial and things. And I was saying stuff about, you know, clashing and things being out of bounds and all of that. And when I was doing this, I was wading into a very large pre-existing literature about norms of assertion. I was aware that I was doing that. I was ignoring most of it, uh, but I want to revisit some of that, uh, some of that literature now to say a little bit more because it's going to help me clarify some of the issues that I left unclear. When people talk about norms of assertion, uh, it's very helpful to think of assertion as an act which is governed by norms. But when people do that and talk about norms of assertion, it turns out that the literature sort of divides into three different ways of understanding those norms. You could think of norms governing assertion as norms governing them at the point of production. And so norms governing me as an asserter that might say, well, aim to say what is true. And so you'll have people talking about the truth norm of assertion and they'll say things like, well, if you assert, make an assertion and it isn't true, then clearly uh, what you've done has failed in some respect or the thing fails to be true. And maybe that's the way that we you know, understand the normative features of you know, engaging in that sort of practice. Or other people defend the knowledge norm and they say only assert what you know. Uh, and there's other, you know, different kinds of epicycles and fixes and patches and punctures when people want to look at different ways of governing, uh, evaluating assertion from the point of view of production. Some people will say, well, you've got to have a kind of justification because what happens when you assert something, some person might come up to you and say, you know, why is that? And I've got to be able to say something. And so they'll talk about things in terms of justification. There's lots of different things that you could say there. But that's only one way of understanding how to uh, understand the norms of assertion. Another kind of thing you could do with understanding the normative texture of the practice of assertion is to look instead at the point of consumption rather than the point of production. And then they'll say that here's what's special about assertion. When I make an assertion, then you are entitled to redo what it is that I did. You can redo that and pass on the assertion. You know, if I inform you about something, then you can inform somebody else. And when they ask you to back it up, you can pass the buck back to me. That's how testimony works. So you vouch for the assertion by vouching for, uh, vouching back to, pointing back to the person who made the assertion to you. Not all speech acts are like this. You know, if I ask you to do something, that doesn't entitle, you know, that you to ask somebody else necessarily, because maybe that's not necessarily passing on the action in the same kind of way. Uh, I can promise something to you that doesn't entitle you to pass that very promise on to somebody else. It's got a different kind of downstream um, uh, behavior. It does uh, the the way that assertion can be consumed is kind of different. And so you get people that talk about that too. Then there's another way of understanding the, the kind of norms governing assertion in terms of not me, uh, the speaker, not you, the listener, uh, but us uh, and the sort of space between us, as it were. And this is, you know, uh, an account which is, you know, made famous and studied quite a lot by Stolnacker and, and his disciples and others that have worked on common ground. Uh, to assert is to bid for the content asserted to be added to the common ground. The body of information that we in the conversation are building on, are taking for granted. 
So when I assert something, I'm putting it out there for us to build on. And so yeah, clearly there's elements of the you and elements of the me and all of that in there, but it's another way of understanding the, the kind of features of the act of assertion. So here's a, here's a quote from Stallnacker from Common Ground to presuppose something, because this is connected to uh, other ways that things enter the common ground. Assertion is an explicit bid to add something to the common ground, but there's other ways that things can get in there. But to presuppose something is to take it for granted, or at least to act as if you take it for granted as background information, as common ground in the participants in a conversation. What's most distinctive about this propositional attitude is that it's social or public. You know, what makes something in the common ground, when one presupposes that phi, that happens only if one presupposes that all of us are doing it as well. So it's a public thing. It's not just you, it's not just me, but it's this sort of shared informational uh, space or scoreboard, which is being shaped and affected uh, in the conversation. And assertion is a very explicit way of uh, bidding to update the common ground. Now, I'm really interested in assertion and the relationship between assertion and denial. And uh, in 2005, I said little beyond the, uh, the claim that assertion and denial are incompatible. I said that they clashed with each other. One of the jobs that you might have heard me say this just now earlier, one of the jobs of assertion is to rule out denial. One of the jobs of denial is to rule out assertion. I believe all of that, but I think there's much more that you could say and should say than this. Uh, I didn't really say the sense in which these things are incompatible. And if I just leave it at that, that doesn't help very much distinguish denial from retraction, for example. Now, there's a sense in which retraction is, of course, not incompatible with assertion, because retracting an assertion kind of relies on having made the assertion. But there's another sense in which, you know, I say it's sunny, and then somebody, you know, points out all the clouds, and I say, oh, I'll take that back, and I retract the claim. There's a sense in which that retraction is incompatible with the assertion in that they have different effects and opposed effects on the common ground. You know, one of them is a bid to put something in and the other is to, to take that thing out. So they clash with one another, but they clash with each other in a different way uh, than assertion and denial might. So I'm gonna address this issue and say more about the relationship between assertion and denial by looking at their connection to polar questions and answers to polar questions in the light of what we've just said about assertion and its norms. So we're in the next section already, polar questions. Now, when I say, is it the case that P, that's a distinct speech act, which has got its own norms. Uh, there's various things that you can say about, you know, dealing with this correctly. One, th uh, one sort of form of words that I will use is that when I uh, ask a polar question, I'm raising an issue. Think of the, the content, the P, the issue, the thing that's at issue. And there are two ways canonically to settle the issue. Positive answers. In English, one of the words we use for that is yes. And negative answers, like no, they settle the issue. They're not the only acceptable responses to the polar question that P, but canonically, the settling answers to a polar question. What makes them polar questions is that the settling answers are basically the yes type and the no type. Now, these two answers to a polar question disagree. If I say yes and you say no to the same polar question, then we disagree because we're taking different positions on P. I take that as relatively fundamental. Maybe we can argue about that later, but I take it that if we can find ourselves on the same page when I say yes and you say no, then I think what we're actually doing is we're disambiguating and saying, oh, you know, yes in this sense, no in that sense. It turns out that there were two issues there. If we're settling on the one question and I say yes and you say no to it and it's a, an issue to settle, then we disagree. We're taking different positions on page because there's no shared position which incorporates both of our answers. Now, other kinds of responses to polar questions like maybe, or don't know, or I think so, they may be addressing the issue in some way, but they're not settling it in the same way. They're acceptable responses to the polar questions, but they don't settle the issue of pain. 
So there's a bunch of things that you could say in response to a polar question, which are, you know, grammatically, rhetorically correct. They follow the kinds of norms. They might be the correct thing for you to say, uh, but they're not settling issues unless they sort of yes type or no type. Now, settling answers sort of count as assertions by all of the different sorts of normative standards, either where speaker focused or hearer focused or common ground focused. A yes or a no to a polar question P counts as an assertion. It's governed by all of those sorts of norms. You know, they can be criticized on truth or justification or knowledge sorts of grounds. They can be passed on as answers to some, you know, if somebody else wants the question answered and I answered it to you, you've now got a license to answer it to somebody else. They update the common ground, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So this raises an interesting question for me. Uh, what does a no to the polar question P assert? Presumably it asserts the negation of P. If we're looking at the contents of the assertion, if you think that every assertion has got some content, uh, presumably if you ask me, is it the case that P and I say no, common ground's updated, what's in the common ground, presumably it's something like it's not the case that P if we all accept what was said. Now, this here you're going to go through, this is going to a debate that goes back to Frege and Dummett and a whole bunch of people who've asked about the relationship between denial and assertion. And although in my 2005 paper, I argued that one should take denial as prior to the assertion of a negation, nothing in what I'm going to be doing here relies on us taking that sort of answer. I do prefer taking the answer yes to P as ruling the content P in and saying no to the polar question P as ruling P out. So rather than thinking of this as a fundamentally an assertion of a negative thing, I prefer first thinking of it as a denial of a content because then we can distinguish practices where the issues that we're looking at are closed under negation and those which have got more limited expressive resources where we can say yes or no to issues that are raised by others, but we can't make a compound issue which itself involves a negation. But nothing that I'm going to be saying here in this talk relies on taking that approach. If you're a committed Phrygian or a Dametian who thinks that denial is the assertion of a negation, you know, have at it. I'm not going to argue with you here. Nothing important in this talk hangs on that distinction. I'm just letting you know where my preferences are. So with that said, I'm going to try and say everything in such a way that both of those approaches to the relationship between uh, asserting P and asserting not P or denying uh, P in that sense of saying no to the polar question P I'm wanting to keep both of these sort of Phrygian and non Phrygian uh, unilateralist and bilateralist approaches open. So in what follows, I'm going to think of the common ground as, you know, the common ground are the things that we're taking for granted. Now, if we follow Stallnacker, we model that immediately in terms of a set of possible worlds and all of that kind of stuff. It'll become clear now that we're go very soon that we're going to have reasons to not follow him in that. But independently of whether we want to follow him in that or not, let's just for the moment keep track of, here's some things that we've ruled in and here's some things that we've ruled out. So think of the X stuff on the left as things that we've ruled in, things that we've taken for granted, said yes to, and the Y stuff are things that we've ruled out, that we've taken for granted, that we're saying no to. So we'll think of the X stuff as positive common ground and we'll think of the Y stuff as negative common ground. And if you want to think of that as really one bucket and we're just looking at the stuff which has got a knot in front of it and the stuff which hasn't, great, go for it. But I'm not going to do that myself. You can think of this as a conversational scoreboard and you can also think of our individual commitments as having this kind of structure as well, because there are things that I'm committed to that aren't public. Uh, there are things that I'm that are informing what I'm saying that are not part of the common ground. We can agree to disagree. We can recognise and talk about our own private commitments in the public space. Uh, but what I'm saying is that one one thing that is useful is to keep track of uh, in various ways the things that have been ruled in and the things that have been ruled out. Okay, now. 
I'm going to use these things that are these these ideas that I've been talking about so far to examine the relationship between denial and retraction, because this has been you know taken by you know Imogen Dickey and a bunch of other people who've been a bit critical about the line that's run in multiple conclusions. They've asked me to say more to say, hang on, does every time that I say no in response to something is that a denial? So. For example, look at this dialogue, and we'll just use Abelard and Eloise and their son, Astrolabe. Uh, you know, Abelard says, Astrolabe's in the study. Eloise responds by saying, no, he's in the kitchen. It's very plausible to think that there's no that Eloise is, uh, 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 you know, asserting there is expressing a denial of what Abelard has said. Okay. Now, Think, contrast this with this case. You know, this goes back to, to Grice at, at the very least in, you know, understanding the behavior of this sort of denial. Abelard says Astrolabe's in the study and Eloise says, no, he's either in the kitchen or in the study. So you imagine they're searching around, they've looked at all of the places or so, so Abelard thinks. And so Abelard says, ah, oh, Astrolabe's in the study. And Eloise recognizes that they've not checked the kitchen either. And so Eloise is saying, no, he's either in the kitchen or the study. Now, if you think that that no is expressing a denial in the sense of something like the assertion of the negation, then that's crazy uh, because she is not asserting the negation of Abelard is in the study because then, you know, Presumably Eloise is reasonably smart and presumably Eloise is not a relevantist and she's able to do the disjunctive syllogism there, you know, reasonably quickly and say, okay, he's in the kitchen. And it would have been more informative if she'd said that. So it's not a denial in that sense. So how am I to distinguish these two no's? Well, I want to contrast this with the case of responding to the polar question instead. When Abelard says, is Astrolabe in the study? And Eloise responds, no, and then elaborates by saying he's in the kitchen. Then it is clear that that no is an answer to the polar question and saying, no, he's not in the study. Whereas, is Astrolabe in the study? No, he's either in the kitchen or in the study. That seems to me to not be quite acceptable. You know, if I was going to say that, I don't think it would be appropriate to say no in that point. Instead, Eloise might say, maybe, maybe he's in the study. He's either in the kitchen or in the study. So how are we to distinguish, uh, how can we use this sort of distinction between uh, the answer to the polar question responses to Abelard and the uh, responses to Abelard when he was making the assertions? Well, one thing that you can agree with is that let's call strong denial, Abelard's, uh, Abelard's question is astrolabe in the study, Eloise's response, no, that's going to count as the strong denial of the content Abelard's in the study. Okay. She's saying, no, that's not the case. And then it's expanded by saying he's in the kitchen. And I think very much like that in the case of uh, response to the assertion, it's quite plausible to say that this is a, a strong denial in that sense. So what's going on in this case? I don't think that's counting as a strong denial. I think what, what's going on here in the case of the response to the polar question is that he's either in the kitchen or in the study is being offered as a partial answer to the question. But what, uh, what Eloise is wanting to be in the common ground, wanting to be taken for granted for everyone is not the thing that Abelard was asking the question about, but a weaker claim, the disjunctive is either in the kitchen or in the study. So here, you know, it's a partial answer. There's no denial that's going on there because there's nothing here that Abelard is saying to deny. She is not rejecting the claim that Astrolabe is in the study in the sense of ruling it out, but she's rejecting it in the sense of saying that it is going too far. So, if we think of that, it looks like we've got scope for distinguishing what's going on in this no that's going on here. She is not asking for astrolabe is not in the study. 
to be put in the common ground or astrolabes in the study to be negatively put in the common ground as the things that we've ruled out. Rather, she is resisting the assertion and saying, no, I want to block putting that in the common ground. And so that's what I'm going to use to distinguish weak denial and strong denial because they're different responses to assertions where an assertion is a bid to put something in the common ground. Uh, there's different ways to resist that. One is to resist it and to deny the thing in the sense of putting its negation in the common ground or putting it negatively in the common ground. And the other is to resist it and say, no, you're going too far, pull back. We should still be open on this. So here's the line that I'm gonna run. Here's the difference between strong and weak denial. To strongly deny P is to bid to add P to the negative common ground, the things that we've ruled out. To weakly deny P is to block the addition of P to the positive common ground or to bid for its retraction if it's already there. And they're different acts, okay? So, and, and you, with that analysis of what's going on, you can see why strong and weak denials of P are both appropriate responses to an assertion of P because an assertion of P is a bid to add P to the positive common ground. So you could either, you know, block it and say, no, we should be, taking exactly the opposite attitude to that, thank you very much, or block it because we should still be open to the issue, either option on the issue. Whereas a strong denial of P, totally fine as a way of settling the question P, to settle it negatively, whereas a weak denial of P is not generally you know, appropriate as a response to the polar question because the polar question doesn't place the content in the common ground, so there's nothing there to block. It's, in fact, when I ask the polar question, I'm basically indicating that it's open. It's not in the common ground, otherwise I wouldn't be asking it. So there's nothing there to block. So the no's and responses to the polar question are read as strong denials and never read as weak denials, or very rarely read as weak denials. So, well, if you've got that, if you've got strong and weak denials uh, and you've got any kind of bilateralist bone in your body, like I do, uh, it's very plausible to look for strong and weak assertions as well. So if a strong denial is adding to the negative common ground, strong assertion is adding to the positive common ground, weak denial is to retract or block from the positive common ground. So presumably, weak assertion would be retracting or blocking from the negative common ground. What would that be? Perhaps. You know, I'm saying I'm still open to P. In fact, if we've ruled out P, I'm now opening it up and saying, no, we should be open to P, maybe P, we should consider P, that sort of thing. There, even if you've been taken for granted, that is not the case of P, ruling P out. If I'm just saying perhaps P, then one way to understand the normative force of that is saying, no, we should, we should be open to that. And that's a bid for a retraction from the negative common ground. And our languages have got ways of expressing that. So, that's one way to understand the relationship between assertion and denial and to do some distinguishing that I didn't do in multiple conclusions between the strong denial from other negative speech acts like weak denial and also retraction and things. So before we go on to the justification request stuff and the last sections, I want to look at one consequence of this. And here I'm going to uh, elaborate on why I'm not following Stormacker and thinking of the common ground as a set of possible worlds. Because I think uh, if we buy the story that I'm giving so far, it should be much more finely individuated, at least in some circumstances. The common ground, what we together take for granted, seems to be very, very finely grained. So think of a, another circumstance where Abelard is being tutored by Eloise in geometry and he's reasoning about a triangle and he's got this particular triangle here and he's looking at him and looking at the triangle and he's noticing, oh, the interior angles are 40 and 60 and 80. And so he adds up those angles and he notices that they sum to 180 degrees and he says, the interior angles of triangles add up to 180 degrees. So says Abelard. And Eloise responds and says, no, the interior angles of this triangle add up to 180 degrees. Can you prove the general case? She's bidding to block his assertion 
from the common ground. Now, she's not denying it. She knows it's true. But just as in the domestic case, she has accused Abelard of overrunning what he's justified in saying. In the geometric tutoring case, he's overrun what he's justified in you know, saying. He's not shown his working yet. Eloise seems to block from the common ground to weakly deny something which is actually a fairly immediate logical or mathematical consequence of the claims in the common ground, you know, the axioms of geometry and stuff. Maybe just a logical consequence if enough of the mathematics is in the common ground. And, and this is for the same sort of reason that we accept other weak denials. This would be absolutely impossible if the common ground was a set of worlds. This is highly, highly, you know, hyper-intentional. But I think it is exactly uh, the kinds of policing that we do of each other's justifications and of each other's assertions. So that's one reason I think that it's totally fine sometimes to assert stuff and weakly deny things which are logical consequences of those. Totally think that's okay. What's wrong is to assert stuff, uh, to strongly assert stuff and strongly deny their logical consequences. That's where the clash is. Okay. So yeah, this is just what I'm saying here. If a, a sequence is derivable, then it's out of bounds to strongly assert each member of the left-hand side and strongly deny each member of the right-hand side. But this example shows that it needn't be out of bounds to strongly assert each member of X and weakly deny each member of Y. Or just focus on one member of Y. So uh, Abela, I mean, Eloise totally knows all the geometry. <laughs> she totally knows this case. Uh, and she knows, she agrees in her heart of hearts that uh, you know, this claim is true but she still thinks that Abelard should not be saying it. And, and, and bids in the common ground in this, this is not in common ground, she says. Withdraw that until you can, until we check more. And then it'll be entered in again. I think that's totally fine. So this is on to position talk. Any position in which A has been strongly asserted and strongly denied is out of bounds. That's what's out of bounds. And so that's how I read that as a sequence. And then I will think of a position where there is no such clash as available. And so we can think of this as kind of a, a possible place on the field of play where there is no, no clash involved, no landmines hidden there. And so now we can go back to cut. Here's the cut rule that I was looking at before. In any available position, so if this thing were available, then one way to settle the polar question, if one way to settle the polar question, like uh, denying it were not available, if there were a clash involved in asserting the X's, denying the Y's and denying A, then what I'm arguing, what I have argued, is that you know, that means that the other way to settle it is available. After all, isn't the issue, uh, you know, what about A? Isn't isn't that already thereby implicitly settled by what we had before? Now, there's lots of debates. Uh, if Dave were here, we'd have discussions about, you know, what the non-transitive uh, person might say uh, about this. But I think that there is a, uh, an appropriate, you know, worth further exploring, you know, view of the way that the norms of assertion and denial are connected, which, uh, you know, are happy with cut. So, Let's talk some more about positions and rules in the remaining time that we've got. I um, have defended these things as you know, definitions of uh, these concepts because we're saying something about how to assert or how to deny negations, conjunctions, disjunctions, just in terms of this assertion denial practice stuff. I think of these things as kinds of definitions showing how to treat assertions and denials in terms of, of, of the concepts defined in terms of the assertions or denials of their components. And so if you get a derivation of something like this, it says something like P or not P is undeniable because to deny P or not P would be uh, thereby to commit yourself in the same sort of way as denying P and denying not P. And to deny P has got the same cash value as to assert not P. And then you'd be asserting P, asserting not P and, assert, and denying not P and how you've contradicted yourself. Same thing here for showing that P and not P uh, is going to be uh, always a clash involved in asserting it. And here's a you know, more complicated derivation of a kind of distribution. Okay? You get these derivations and you can see these as ways of talking about how various positions are ruled out of the field of play. Uh, 
don't get yourself in a position where you assert P and Q or R, but you deny P and Q or R. Okay. Now, I used to sometimes slide between thinking of these sequent derivations as proofs and thinking of them as derivations. But if you look at these, they certainly don't look like proofs because proofs prove things. And the things that they prove are claims. They're not sequence. They're, you know, you proved that something is the case. And I was not proving that something was the case there. I was just telling you that P or not P is undeniable. Okay. Now, that's clearly closely related to proving P or not P, but it's not the same thing. So these things don't have the same shape as proofs. If I look at a sequence like this, P or Q on the one hand and P and a Q on the other, what's the conclusion? Usually proofs have got conclusions and try as I might to uh, make people think that you could have more than one of them. People have not really bought that. Uh, they tend to think that when I've got a proof, I prove a thing. And there's a sense in which they're right. Uh, so I want to explain this. The end sequence of a sequent derivation, even if I've only got one thing on the right-hand side, doesn't tell you to infer A from X. It merely tells you to not assert all of the members of X and to deny A. So I want to make this problem really, really sharp. Many of you will recognize this little passage uh, from Achilles and the Tortoise and Lewis Carroll. This little, you know, deductive paradox, which you got a discussion between Achilles and the tortoise, and we've got this little bit of reasoning, and, you know, one says to the other, hey, look, enter these things, you know, the tortoise says to Achilles, enter these things in your notebook, and in order to refer to them conveniently, let's call them A, B, and Z. A is things that are equal to the same or equal to each other. B is the two sides of this triangle are things that are equal to the same. And Z is the two sides of the triangle are equal to each other. Readers of Euclid will grant, I suppose, that Z follows logically from A and B. So anybody who accepts A and B must accept Z. Well, yes, of course. But what if somebody had not yet accepted a and B is true. They might accept the sequence as being valid. Yeah, you could do that. But what if you accepted A and B, but you didn't yet accept that this was good reasoning? And Achilles says, oh, yeah, I suppose so. So suppose you granted A and B. And now, uh, okay, so you're not forced to accept Z until you accept that the sequence is valid. So, okay, what if you accept that the sequence is valid? So you accept that if A and B, then Z. Uh, but now, what if you still haven't quite got Z yet? Oh, yeah, I suppose that might be the case. So, okay, well, what if you accepted A and B and if A and B, then Z? And, well, what you need to do is to be convinced of if A and B and if A and B, then Z. And if all of that stuff, then Z. You need to accept that as well to get the Z. And you're off on a, a massive regress. What happens here? Uh, the tortoise in egging Achilles on is always accepting the premises of an argument and not denying the conclusion, but they are refusing from accepting the premises of this argument as a reason for the conclusion. I'm saying, you know, tell me more. I want to have some more as a reason why this Z is true. So simplifying it a bit to not A and B and Z, but just imagine you had a premise and a conclusion. The tortoise maybe accepts the premise, wants to know about the conclusion, you know, is then told, well, if, if the premise, then the conclusion, they'll grant that too, and still wants to know about the conclusion. They're never denying that the conclusion is true, but they're wanting more. Uh, they're wanting more of a reason than what you've got. What's going on here is not a matter of assertion and denial. What, Achilles, what, the, um, Achilles, what the tortoise is doing to Achilles in this dialogue is offering a justification request, saying, please, tell me more. Tell me why this is the case. And I reckon it's going to be helpful to look at the, the norms governing justification requests. What is a justification request? It's uh, actually connected to the norms governing assertion that we were talking about way back in the beginning. You know, imagine Abelard says, Astrolabe's in the kitchen. Eloise might respond, really? That's a justification request. And Abelard might say something in response. Like, I saw him there five minutes ago. And Eloise will say, okay. Okay, cool. And so now uh, she's granted that Astrolabe's in the kitchen. She's granted that 
uh, Abelard saw him five minutes ago and these things are in the common ground. On the other hand, Abelard might say, Astrolabe's in the kitchen. Eloise might respond with a justification request. Really? Abelard will say, I saw him there five minutes ago saying the same things that he said before. And Eloise might say, are you sure? He's been in the study with me for the last half hour. I'm just checking you out. Are you keeping track of, uh, are you keeping track of Astrolabe? So you can see here, the same thing is being offered as an answer to the justification request. And it might be accepted sometimes, might be uh, rejected others. You know, Astrolabe's in the kitchen, really? Saw him there five minutes ago. Yes, but he was in the study two minutes ago. So in this case, she's not denying the thing that Abelard says next. She's agreeing or letting Abelard have the claim that he was there in the kitchen five minutes ago. But now in this case, she's saying, even though I grant this, I'm not granting it as a reason for thinking that he's in the kitchen now because he's a fast moving little bugger. He was in the study with me. Okay. So we should expect being able to call people on assertions, given the norms of assertions that we've, hit, you know, we've been talking about, given the commitments and entitlements that are involved in assertion. We should expect there to be an opportunity to call on somebody who makes an assertion. If I give you permission to ask me to vouch for my assertion, then you should be able to call me on it. And that's what a justification request is doing. Now, here's a first cut of what a justification request is doing, normatively speaking. A justification request for a strong assertion or a strong denial is an attempt to block the addition to the common ground that this assertion or denial proposes until another thing is done. And that's a giving of a reason. The reason is another assertion or denial which must itself be granted, added to the common ground in order for the request to be met. So I'm just doing a little bit of source control on you, checking you, checking you out. Uh, are you sure? see if you can you know, back this up in some way. And I've got to, if, given that the justification request was, was asked, if I reject your justification, I'm not going to thereby still pass through your accepting your assertion. I might accept your assertion for another reason if you give another reason. Granting the reason is a necessary but not sufficient re, uh, uh, is necessary but not sufficient for just for satisfying the justification request. So we saw in the example, you know, Abel, um, Eloise uh, granted that Abel, what Abelard said when he said that Astrolabe was in the kitchen five minutes ago, but didn't accept that as a reason for the claim that he's in the kitchen now, because she he was in the study two minutes ago. Okay, so let's look at the connection between definitions and justification requests, because I think there's something really important going on here. So this is a, a, a hacky um, made up Achilles and the tortoise dialogue that I made, uh, which will involve a definition. Achilles says, so this is an equilateral triangle. And the tortoise, being gnarly, says to Achilles, I'm sorry, I don't follow my heroic friend. I've not heard that word before. What does equilateral mean? Achilles says, oh, it's easy to explain. Equilateral means having sides of the same length. An equilateral triangle is a triangle with all three sides of the same length. Tortoise, okay, sounds good. Continue with your reasoning. Achilles says, well, as I was saying, the sides of this triangle are all one cubit in length, so it's an equilateral triangle. Now, if the tortoise goes on and says, perhaps you'll forgive me, Achilles, but I still don't follow. I grant to you that these sides of this triangle all have the same length. I fail to see, however, that it follows that it's equilateral. Could you explain why it is? I reckon uh, the tortoise is just being narky at this point. The tortoise is not only being narky, the tortoise is showing that he doesn't understand the definition or he's not competent with the definition. I think it's plausible to say that if you accept a definition which has been proffered of A being defined as B, then you should accept granting A as meeting a justification request of the assertion of B and ruling out A as meeting a justification request of B's denial and vice versa. So is one way of me displaying that I haven't yet grasped the definition or I'm not yet competent with it if I'm not gonna use it in these question answering contests or justification request contexts. It's a failure to master the definition to do that. And I think that's a very plausible uh, analysis of what's going on in, the, in that kind of uh, 
sort of, you know, rewriting definition. You know, equilateral is just shorthand for uh, sides, of, sides having the same length in the case of triangles. Well, if you buy it in that case, maybe you can buy it in the same way when it comes to the defining rules that I was giving. So if you think of that in terms of just A, a rewrite rule, we'll define B in terms of A or define A in terms of B. Well, maybe we can do the same thing here with a defining rule like this, which says that an assertion of A and B has got the same cash value as the assertion of A and the assertion of B. I reckon it's just as much of a mistake to grant A and grant B and to look for something more to discharge a justification request for an assertion of A and B if you take this as a definition. If you take this as a definition, then it's not only saying don't assert the conjunction, sorry, don't assert the conjuncts and deny the conjunction. It's also, if you've asserted the conjunction, the, sorry, if you've asserted A and you've asserted B, then you've got everything you need to meet a justification request for the assertion of A and B. Okay. You can do the same thing with other defining rules like this, which say that you know, a justification request for the denial of a material conditional is just gonna be met by uh, the assertion of the antecedent and the denial of the consequent to fail to accept that would be to fail to accept this as a definition of the concept. Now, a little bit more work is gonna be re required to show why granting, uh, granting an, the assertion of an antecedent and the assertion of a conditional is enough to meet a justification request for the assertion of the consequent, but I think that can be done. The handout goes through this in more detail and there's more stuff in the slides, but in view of the time, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. But one thing that you can do is you can think of these sequence, which I focused on thinking of them just as don't assert all of these guys and deny all of those guys. But it's just as possible to think of a sequence as something which says in the context of asserting these guys and denying those guys and just focus on one other thing. And we can think of this as the background under which we can answer the issue or the question or the justification request of this thing which is under focus. So you can read this premise as saying, in a position in which A implies Z has already been ruled in, we don't need to look anywhere else to answer the justification request of the assertion of that. Just notice, hey, we already granted that. It's not an issue at the moment. And so this is then saying that if we'd asserted A implies Z and asserted A, that's gonna be enough to justify Z. Now, why? Because there's gonna be things that you can say about this rule which say, talking about an assertion of answering a question of A implies Z uh, in terms of, you know, temporarily granting the antecedent and seeing whether you can answer the question of the consequent under those circumstances. And that's a way of understanding, you know, deduction under a hypothesis. So there's a whole bunch of more things that you can say about how this works, but it takes you away from just thinking about this sequence in terms of don't assert these guys and deny those guys, and think of these sequence as well in terms of meeting a justification request for one of these things against the background of the rest. And so here you get this picture, which is still bilateralist in terms of we rule these things in, we rule these things out, but now it's also single conclusion in the sense that we're thinking of answering the question of this guy. Why is it the case that I, given that we've already ruled these things and ruled, ruled these things in and ruled those things out. I mean, it's sort of single conclusion, except you could just as well focus on something in the antecedent and think of this sort of, you know, negative reasoning, why it is that we should rule A out. So given that we've granted the X's, ruled the X's in and ruled the, y, ruled the Y's out, then this derivation will tell us why it's not the case that I. So, is a derivation which is telling us how to do this. Now, I'm not gonna go through all the details, the slides and the uh, um, handout goes through a, a kind of explanation of how these rules can be read in this focusing sort of way. And we can do this in Q&A if you wanna learn some more. But as I was saying before, this gives us a way of understanding how supposition might work. If I wanna address the issue of whether a conditional is the case. Well, one thing that I could do is see how I could address the issue of the consequent under a 
circumstance where I've granted the antecedent. But just as well, I could address the issue of why, if it's the case that A then B, by you know, ruling out the consequent and using that to explain why the antecedent must fail. That would be another way of explaining why, if A then B. Okay, now the uh, handout has got a dialogue which explains how we could, you know, put all of this stuff together and get a, a crazy, you know, dialogue between Abelard and Eloise justifying Peirce's law of all, you know, godforsaken classical tautologies. Uh, just in terms of these kinds of norms, uh, if you think of these things, the, the rules governing, you know, and and or and if and not, in this kind of classical setting, then yeah, you do uh, get a justification of all of these sorts of classical sequence, which I reckon just tells you, you know, that's what the material conditional says. It's not really much of a conditional. It even enables you to prove things like this, but in ways where the norms, the rules governing this are the kinds of things which seem kind of, you know, natural things to do. Like proving a conditional is, done by proving the consequent under the scope of the supposition of the antecedent, where now we think of proving this as meeting the justification request for the assertion of the thing in a particularly strong kind of way. So, not going to go through the details of how that works, we can do that in Q&A, but I'll tell you where this leads us. We've got answers to the concerns about the sequence calculus that people had uh, in response to multiple conclusions. If we understand the conclusion of a proof as a formula which requires a, justifi which, which requires a justification request, and if you think of the proof as a procedure for meeting that request, then we can see why there's one and only one of those. But it doesn't just have to be an assertion, it could be a denial, which we've got a justification request for. It could be on either side, positively or negatively, of the sequent. You can see why we might want one of those. However, since both assertions and denials can be the target of a justification request, it can be on the left or the right. That's just what I said. Since the common ground from which uh, uh, the justification request can be met can contain assertions and denials, we can derive sequents that have got this form and sequents that have got that form. And the making of an inference then is understood in this case as an answer to a justification request. Sometimes an answer to one which has been asked, but sometimes a preemptive one. Sometimes I'm not only going to assert something. When I say A, so B, then what I'm doing on this view is I'm asserting A and I'm asserting B, but I'm offering A as a justification request of B, an answer to any possible justification request of B, all in one go when I say A, so B. So then a derivation of a sequence can be transformed into a procedure for meeting a justification request for the thing that is in focus in any available position appealing only to what was granted in the rest of the sequence. So that's a way of understanding what the logical notions are doing, not just in terms of saying, you know, don't go there these positions are out of bounds. I do think it's doing those things, but you can think of the positive content of deducing as also showing how justification requests can be met. So then I think we can say something about uh, what logic is good for in another way. The bounds on this view, if you take the, the quantified stuff and identity and things like that to also be kind of logical notions, then it turns out what's out of bounds is actually kind of transcends our grasp. We've got no algorithm for determining is this consistent or not. You know, is my assertion of uh, all of the axioms of piano arithmetic and my denial of Goldbach's conjecture, is that out of bounds or not? I don't know. If you can show that it is, explain it to me you'll be famous, you can write the proof out. But the derivations that we give are ways that we can grasp complex bounds, explain them and enforce them by you know, having these little packages of, or big packages of answers to justification requests, which can not only say, oh look, the electric fence is there, that would be inconsistent, but also showing how these things are connected in ways of you know, interconnected strings of or trees or structures of um, justification requests and their answers. The negative view of the bounds 
is seen in terms of the clash between assertion and denial, but the positive view can be seen as the kinds of answers that we can give to justification requests. And then adopting defining rules then is a way that we can be very precise about the norms governing the concepts that we've defined in a way that uh, combines safety, university, uh, university, and expressive power. I haven't talked about that here, but the nice feature about those double line rules that I was pointing to is that they are safe, they conservatively extend the positions that you've got, they're univocal, they uniquely define the concepts that they add, uh, but they enlarge your expressive power. They enable you to say things that you couldn't in the earlier practice. And so that gives you something distinctive to say about these concepts that can be defined in those, those ways, which gives you a place for logic. So that's where I should end. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. All right. Uh, I'm going to open up the question.